Welcome back to another episode of Living Room Logic, but this time we're going to be doing something really cool. We're going to actually talk to Aiden about something he actually knows about. You see... I know. Thank the Lord. Now, once upon a time, I was thinking to myself, hey, I'd love to start a podcast. Do I know anyone with a gorgeous, luscious voice doing anything cool? <laughs> and well, I knew no one like that, but then I thought of Aiden. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought of Aiden. What Aiden was doing at the time was he was trawling the vast Atlantic doing something. And I wasn't entirely sure what it was, but I knew it was a really cool hook for marketing. So I was like, oh. yes, yes, this is the guy. And like, to be fair, mm -hmm. in our defense, uh, I, I knew Aiden since I was 16, 17. And uh, we, ma we made so many mistakes together and we had such a great time doing all of that <laughs> stuff. So Aiden, you were trawling across the Atlantic, fighting the high seas and mm. collecting jellyfish. What the hell are jellyfish? Jellyfish is a term given to a hugely diverse group of animals that... Um, you know, I, I managed to study uh, a good few species in Irish waters, but um, they're this cool. massive group. It's it's actually called a polyphyletic group, and that's just a uh, sciencey uh -huh. jargon for there are species from lots of different, very evolutionarily different groups of gooey animals. Right. And the literally the only thing that they need to share is that they have more than 95% of their body mass is water. Okay. So that's literally what a what a, a jellyfish is or this broader term that we like to use in our area of research is gelatinous zooplankton. Oh, okay. cool. Oh, so would this be similar to just saying something is a bug? Yes, Yeah. exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah, bringing in everything that is gooey in the ocean. <laughs> and because a lot of people think, well, jellyfish need to sting. Yeah. Well, it's actually not one of the criteria. No way. A lot of jellyfish sting. Um jellyfish from a group called Scyphozoa, which is actually those kind of the classic jellyfish, you mm. think, with the, the umbrella and the kind of draping tentacles. Mm -hmm. um, but they're actually just one group of... Uh, they, they're kind of the ones that people see uh, most predominantly on beaches, stranded cool. on beaches, or when they're swimming and they freak out and they get stung. Um, so they're the ones that people kind of associate best with or relate most to uh, when they think of the, they, they hear the word jellyfish but you know and before I studied them that's kind of what I thought as well I yeah. would see a compass jellyfish for, for instance or if you're American it's called a sea nettle a very similar species um, gorgeous species has like um, striations like a tiger stripes on it on its umbrella and and some pretty gnarly long tentacles um, and it looks quite gorgeous, but also pretty terrifying. But little did I know that m most of the species are actually really small oh. and they're they're actually microscopic um, and you don't even see them when you're swimming. And but when you do look at them under the microscope, they're absolutely beautiful and there's all shapes and sizes and jellyfish can basically oh, be several shapes, several sizes from microscopic to several meters long. That's super, super cool. And like out of interest, just because like, you know, most people don't actually get to see any jellyfish, you know, and the ones we do see are looking pretty mm. flat on the shore 90% uh, of the time, or we might catch <laughs> yeah, that out the yeah. corner of our eye and immediately swim away. So like, what are some of the coolest jellyfish that are out there or that you've seen? There's danger and there's size and there's shape. So yeah. I'd say in terms of the most dangerous jellyfish, I have seen a box jellyfish in South Africa. I was oh. in Cape Town and it was in the bay. And it was pretty big, actually, compared to... They're supposed to be quite a small species, uh -huh. but um, the box jellyfish is one of the most je uh, venomous jellyfish in the world. And if you get stung by it, you will almost always need some anti-venom or... Uh, you know, you better hope that there's some no um, medical medical professionals nearby wow. um so that was pretty amazing seeing one of those especially when you compare it to irish jellyfish they're typically not as venomous yeah um so <laughs> we just we were in cape town me and some of my colleagues at a conference 
and we we saw this and we were all freaking out um and everyone else in uh, at the shoreline was just like yeah it's a box jellyfish <laughs> no way <clears throat> so it was, it was quite amazing to see it um but one of the coolest things I've, I've ever seen was when i was out on a survey uh every summer i usually go out on a summer survey where we um we trek kind of um all the way from the coast of france and we kind of survey the entire of irish waters from france right up to the west coast of scotland Mm -hmm. um and there's a a a area of islands just off the west coast of scotland called the um, the hebrides and there's seawater in between so we go down there on our way home and it's home to one of the largest jellyfish species in the world which is called the lion's mane yeah um and it was some of these lion's mane jellyfish were so big that there were dolphins swimming in and out of you know in between the 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 lion's mane jellyfish and the lion's mane were bigger that's and so crazy. that and we're talking about the umbrella like the, yeah. the top of it the top part of the jellyfish oh um God. and the the tentacles of the lion's mane can be up to 40 meters long whoa and they can have up to a thousand tentacles so they're what pretty the terrifying that sounds terrifying and um, but they actually <laughs> oh come down the hebrides and they're a northern species but so they they can get by the time they kind of show up in Irish waters, they're actually quite large. And so that's why nearly off the coast of Scotland, they're they're nearly one meter or two meter long in terms of mm. their bell diameter. The, that's what we call the distance from one side of the umbrella to the other, the bell. Um, so uh, that's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. That's absolutely outrageous, Aiden. Because I, mm. you know, I, I think we're so, uh, maybe we're just accustomed to teeny tiny little, you know, trans translucent kind of jellyfish with maybe a little bit of colour in them. And you might go, oh, look at yeah. that. But it's absolutely freaking me out thinking of massive jellyfish and uh, all of that stuff. That's kind of scary. Mm. But one thing I'm kind of curious about, because I maybe maybe I'm wrong. But when I was younger, I felt like I was seeing more jellyfish or maybe that's because mm. I just have a core, a few core memories of absolute fear in the face of seeing a jellyfish next to me in the water. But maybe I just don't go into the ocean as much. So like is the um, is the population of jellyfish in Ireland changing or is it changing worldwide? Is it getting more or less? Because I don't know. It's almost one of the largest debates in terms of jellyfish science because, you know, a lot of people would say, okay, come on, why jellyfish are cool, they're interesting, they're beautiful and all that, but why are you studying them? You know, are, do they actually, is, is there actually a proper use to this? For sure, yeah. Um, and, and that was one of the major questions that was asked of um jellyfish researchers are they becoming more frequent especially because we're in a time right now of serious environmental change in the world so you know we've already done a couple episodes on climate change and how the climate's changed in the past and and right now the war- earth is getting warmer and a lot of people think well oh because jellyfish are such kind of um anatomically simple uh species and animals that they could potentially actually benefit from this mm. uh a, an increase in temperature well does that mean that they will be able to expand their ranges and and become yeah, more of a actually, problem cool. to to people in coastal areas causing more stings and hospitalizing more people killing more people in some places in the world and they also cause a lot of jellyfish cause a lot of problems with fish farms they can actually go through fish farms and their tentacles can break up and go into the gills of fish oh and kill them and um, so that can be huge economic losses for fish farms we're talking millions of euro just in a single day a swarm of jellyfish will will uh, come through a, a fish farm a fish cage and kill all the salmon My. next thing you know that that business is gone you know That's they're outrageous. done so 
it's they're re- it's really important to understand their abundance over time and and how, seasonally how that changes and if it's changing over several years. Um. So one particular place that they've really seen quite a a, a scary increase in jellyfish is in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and the Mediterranean is quite interesting because it's warming at a pretty rapid pace right now. And what you're finding is that you're actually getting more southern species like tropicals and subtropical species um, expanding their range further north in the Mediterranean Sea. Mm-hmm. So that is the first thing that you're seeing. And they're also noticing that some summers um, they're getting some of the largest uh, hospitalization numbers um, from jellyfish stings. So one of the reasons they thought was, of course, climate change. And and several pa- papers have definitely shown that there is a strong correlation between climate variability and how much of them show up in, in, in a, a certain summer. But there's also a lot of other stuff going on in the Mediterranean Sea. One thing is that the Mediterranean Sea is like historically been overfished. So mm-hmm. overfishing is a thing where you exploit and take natural fish stocks out of the the you know to a to a level where the stocks can collapse. And a okay. lot of stocks in many parts of the Mediterranean have collapsed. And so it, the kind of increase in jellyfish in some places has been attributed to the fact that there's no fish that are to compete with the jellyfish. So the jellyfish have more food and they become more abundant because of that. Okay. So, and then there's another thing as well is um, pollution. So that's another big thing. And that coastal pollution can actually cause these large phytoplankton blooms. Phytoplankton are just microscopic plants that are the base of the food chain in the ocean. And they feed small crustaceans called zooplankton. Um, crustaceans are like uh, evolutionarily close to crabs and stuff, but they're really tiny shrimp and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, one of the major food types is called copepods. That's just another type of zooplankton. And they're a main food item of of commercial fish and jellyfish. So the jellyfish, uh, because of these larger blooms of uh, phytoplankton, the plants and the small animals, they're f- the jellyfish and the fish is food. There's more fish, but there's also more jellyfish. And the fish are actually being overfished. So there's they're being exploited quite heavily. And that this just leaves space in the ecosystem for jellyfish okay. to dominate. Um, and that's kind of been seen in a couple of different places. Um, quite different jellyfish in, in each scenario, yeah. which is quite interesting. But I, it, it wasn't always, um, it's, it's not everywhere that this is happening. Kind of just trying to uh, contextualize this. Um, mm. what eats jellyfish? So I'm just trying to get an idea of where it is in the food chain. To well, know, that's like... actually a quite interesting question as well, because we would have always thought in the past, say in the 80s, 90s, that jellyfish were kind of like a, a trophic dead end that, you know, jellyfish would eat copepods and stuff and then nothing would eat them. And they would just take energy in the ecosystem away from everything else. But right. turns out that they are actually food to a lot of fish. Okay. Um, and especially young fish tend to feed on small jellyfish a lot. Some of these microscopic species right. that I might talk about later on. Um, but they're, they're, it's becoming more and more apparent that jellyfish are a lot more important in the ecosystem than we would have previously thought. Um, mm. But when you get blooms of these large jellyfish, um, although maybe it could be a very natural thing, it, you do get more things like fish farm kills, and uh, yeah. uh, ki- large kill events in fish farms and um, hospitalizations and people needing medical attention because of stings. So those things are still an issue, even though an increase in jellyfish might be OK. So is it kind of like um, that if you're overfishing fish, you're taking away their competition for the same resource? Is that what, where it's going? exactly it is a lot of the time they think it's because of competition rather than anything else other places there's been a lot of research as well so um another place that they're seeing an increase in jellyfish is is in um the eastern marginal seas in china yeah 
And this is crazy because they have this species called the giant jellyfish, um, <laughs> Nomuria Nomuria. And cool. the the thing is huge. It's even bigger than the lion's mane. And they don't cause uh, too bad of a sting. But what they do is they're so huge and so voluminous that they can actually burst fishing nets. And, and there have actually been cases where fishing nets have capsized because there were just too many jellyfish in a fishing net because the, the, the whole the net was heavier than the, the vessel could, wow. could handle and it flipped the vessel over. Um, so And that's actually been um, reported in the Mediterranean Sea for a different species as well. These things have been seen and, and they've never been seen before. Um, and I think one thing that I must note is that this is a very regional thing. Um, and, and what researchers who've looked at the whole global picture and they've looked at, you know, they, they kind of it's the, in science, we call this a meta analysis. Um, it's mm-hmm. where you get loads of papers from all over the world and you bring them all together. Um what they actually found was that it is really a regional consequence and it's an it's a it, it is regionally specific what species you have is really important to whether they'll they are increasing right now or not mm-hmm. um and many things like how is your local pollution in your in this region how is fishing is there heavy overfishing like the example i gave in the mediterranean sea and then lastly is your climate. Um, but the the climate can actually work in opposite ways as well. Um, because further north or or um in polar regions um in the south uh, southern hemisphere as well, there are jellyfish that prefer colder water. Yeah. So they are very similar to other species in their ecosystem mm-hmm. that you know, you would assume that an Arctic species, whether it's a jellyfish or a fish, that they're actually going to prefer normal natural conditions to what they're adapted to of course. evolutionarily. Yeah. So um, that was actually one thing um, that I did in my own research. Oh, cool. um, yeah. So, I, I mean, just before I get into that, I, I think the take home here is that this these meta analyses that researchers have done in very recent years have shown that globally there is no increase or decrease right now okay but that in certain regions jellyfish are becoming more of a problem because of several things happening synergistically happening mm. all at the same time all helping jellyfish to become more abundant gotcha it's not a global phenomenon. It's a regional phenomenon. Yeah. And actually in some regions, they're decreasing because of something, some other reason. So yeah. um, the, the jury's kind of out on whether jellyfish are, are increasing. It's, it's more, it's a, the answer is it's a lot more complicated and it really depends on where you are in the world. Okay. Yeah. So um, kind of coming back to my own research, I also found the same thing. Um, I did work on species jellyfish species on gelatinous zooplankton in irish waters um so where we are we're in european waters western european waters in a part of the world called the northeast atlantic ocean all mm-hmm. right uh, it's temperate the climate is mild and this is the sort of species that we get we get some species from further south and we get a mix of species from the north as well and it's a big brewing pot of all these different species it's kind of like a trans transition zone gotcha um and it's so that's really quite interesting for us um because we're trying to figure out which who's more predominant who's more dominant in these years and so i managed to to build these two very long-term data sets for one for these smaller species that i was telling you about and one for a particular species of larger jellyfish called pelagia noctiluca um, and I'll talk about Pelagia in a sec. But that first one, I got 12 years of data and I went out on the boats myself and got it um, and, and looked at every single sample uh, of jellyfish I took under a microscope, counted every single jellyfish in every single sample jar that I took using nets. And what we found was that the 
the small jellyfish in Irish waters actually prefer cooler temperatures. No way. So you would have thought, again, this kind of plays into a more complicated story in terms of are jellyfish increasing? Are they not? Well, it's actually really complicated and nuanced. There's lots of diversity in species. So these smaller species like cooler water, maybe because uh, one of our ideas was that it's to do with the way that the, the, the water column is structured in the summer and the water becomes what is known as stratified. That means that there's not a lot of mixing and when there's not a lot of mixing, there's not a lot of food around. So when it's cooler, there is more mixing and there's more chances for mixing to occur or earlier in the year. And so there's that, that time where the water is very stagnant or stratified is shorter. So that would make sense that there's more food around when it's uh, stratified for, for less time. Um, so that's one of our reasons. But they're also could just be that they like cooler temperatures because they are in the northern hemisphere and they're in a a temperate and slightly, uh, you know, our latitude is quite far north. So it would make sense that the species here prefer cooler temperatures, much like all of the other species that um, are in Irish waters. So that was quite interesting. And it goes against the idea that jellyfish are increasing because of climate change. And then that, uh, to make things even more confusing, this species Pelagian octoluca, it's also called the mauve stinger, and it's one of the most kind of problematic jellyfish species in the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's kind of weird that there's a Mediterranean species in Irish waters. Um, but the thing is, they, they don't come around. They're not spotted every year in Irish waters. Okay. So we think they're quite Southern. They like warm water. They like warmer water and kind of warm temperate uh, water. So we, I, I kind of went out to try and figure out, well, are they becoming more frequent because Irish water is getting hotter? Yeah. Um, and so I did a very similar thing with a much larger net and a different survey over, I think I ended up getting 11 years of data. Oh my God. Uh, spanning like 200,000 kilometers squared every year. Whoa. So an incredible amount of uh, stations where we threw this net out, we counted everything in it, including the jellyfish. And weirdly enough, I actually found that this species, although they like hot, warmer water typically, or that's what we think, they were actually correlated with cooler water again. But the interesting thing about no this, this species is that it's an it it's it's an oceanic species, Andrew. So it comes in from the open Atlantic water and open Atlantic water is cooler typically yeah. than water that's by the coast of Ireland. So we kind of linked it to a movement of oceanic open water into Irish coastal water. Gotcha. Um, and we linked it all up. We did quite the pretty sub- uh, substantial statistical modeling that we do not need to get into. <laughs> okay. Thank God. Um, but, but it, but it, the the important thing was that it linked the abundance and frequency, the occurrence of this species in Irish close to Irish, the Irish coast, to wind, cooler temperatures, and some of these climate. Um, uh, indices which uh, I, we don't need to get into but they're just basically showing that natural climate variability changes wind which changes the amount of oceanic water that comes in onto the Irish shelf and basically transports more of these species in certain years more than others um, but the the crazy thing is that the, the 11 years that we spotted them It was the highest frequency of annual occurrence of the species of any decade in uh, since the 1890s. So there is a chance that they are being transported from open water into Irish coastal waters more in the last decade or so. And I'm just kind of wondering, is this so it's almost that the changing concentrations of where these jellyfish are 
is more so mm. to do with the changing. They're kind of following the water that suits them, right? It, it, that's that's kind of what I'm understanding. They aren't following the water that suits them. They are in the water that suits them, and the water does all of the moving for them. Something maybe I should have said very early on is that zooplankton um, just means it just means at the peril of the currents. Okay. Okay. So no that's way. what zooplankton are, and because jellyfish are gelatinous zooplankton, they are at the peril of the currents. They they do swim, um, but not strong enough to be to like a fish can outswim a current, but jellyfish can't most of the time. In that, now I'm just kind of wondering for myself now. So you can kind of mm. follow the movement of jellyfish as a prediction of where the water is going. So if you're seeing a change in climate that is adjusting the way that water is going. Can you almost exactly. say, well, we're finding some jellyfish in this location. That's an indication that water from location X has gotten to location Y. And that means... Lots of researchers actually use jellyfish as a oceanographic tool. Oceanography is just the study of the movement and interaction of water bodies. So um, you okay. can use these really cool software called um, uh, just particle tracking software. And... You can use it to, if you have, say, for instance, I know where my jellyfish were every year from my survey data. If I use satellite data for water movement, um, oceanog o oceanographic satellite data, and actually run that backwards, okay. I can figure out where the jellyfish came from. And That's outrageous. Yeah, and so... That's that that is what we're actually hoping to do in the future. Um, and, you know, we would put money on. We would bet that it is somewhere off the northwest coast of Ireland. Um, in it's a it's a particularly interesting place there, um, which uh, this thing called upwelling occurs. Um, and, and it's actually recently oceanographers, uh, people who study the movement of water, found that there is a, a particular current there that moves up onto the Irish shelf and it's because of the weirdness of the the way that the the shelf drops off into very deep water yeah, there yeah. um so it's really interesting so andrew that is what i did for my phd <laughs> that, <laughs> that's so cool no cuz you know what's really interesting about that but that you you tie together very nicely the um kind of an economic value to following it and following the fish farms. But it's also, like that's something that would never have occurred mm -hmm. to me, that following of, since jellyfish go with the flow, they actually tell you yeah. about the flow. And they're a yeah. physical marker you can measure, which you cannot do with particles of water. You know, you might be yeah. able to do it on a large scale. But at mm -hmm. least it'd be, I, I suppose you could kind of use this data to calibrate other models that are trying to predict water flow through the Atlantic. Yeah, exactly. And and satellites can track the movement of water using temperature and sea height and things like these because the, the pre um, pressure on the, of the atmosphere changes the sea height in weird ways. And that is almost one of the major ways that water moves is because is of crazy. little little tiny regional localized changes in sea pressure what? Uh, atmospheric pressure on sea level height that's... and so <laughs> well that's for a, a, another day i didn't even but... know that was the thing that is uh, we are coming back to that another day that yeah. atmospheric pressure controls sea height to so oh my god okay before before we go off on a mad tangent aiden that was super super cool let's definitely come back to that another episode if you want to catch whenever we've <laughs> come back to that cool topic please drop a follow yeah. and follow us on our social medias okay thank you andrew everyone i hope you have a great time all the best Bye bye